The Scramble for Africa, 1876 to 1912, by Thomas Pakenham. Book review. So this book has got to be my favorite history book of all time. It's just an incredible narrative history. Uh, and what I mean by narrative history is, is one of those books that's it's a history book, but the author is so good at telling history like a story, of developing the characters, of creating suspense in the narrative. So like you're, you're like, oh no, what's going to happen next? Really just sucking you into the story of it. I... As far as those kind of history books go, history as stories, I think this is the, the best one I've read ever. So, if you trust my opinion at all, go out and get this book somehow. Uh, it, it's, an, it's an older book. It was published in 1991. Uh, in, I believe it was the author's British, so I don't know if it's easier to get a hold of in Britain than in other places. But, you know, look it up on Amazon, check your local library, track it down somehow. If, you're, if you like history, uh, I mean, if, if you don't like history, don't bother because it's a history book. But, but if you have any interest in history, if you're any kind of history nerd, trust me on this one. This book is absolutely fascinating. Just, just get a hold of it whatever, however you can. If you're willing to trust me on that, you can stop watching the review right now. Because the rest of this review, I'm just going to talk about how wonderful this book is and go into this and that. And I'm probably going to ramble on for quite some time, actually. I've got quite a lot to say about this particular book. But but the takeaway is it's just a really fascinating book. And, you, you know, the thing is, I did not think it was going to be as fascinating as it was. I, I got this book at a used book sale. Uh, and when I got it, it, it was just a plain brown book. I mean, presumably at one point when it was first published in 1991, it might have had a book cover of some sort, but the copy I had was just plain brown. Uh, if, you, if you track it down in a library nowadays or in a used bookstore, it probably will be plain brown. And it's very thick. It's 738 pages. I, I no longer have my copy with me, but you can imagine it's, it's a proper doorstopper. And the title, I mean, let's face it, the title is not great. The Scramble for Africa, 1876 to 1912. It, it sounds like something dry and academic and boring, but it's not. It's, it's, it's so interesting and so fascinating. So um, the, the, the main draw of this book, like I said, is how well it's written, how well it tells history like a story. But before I get into all that, it, it might be worth just spending a couple minutes talking about the subject material, like what is the Scramble for Africa? Now, uh, if you're like me, the Scramble for Africa did come up in my school days. Uh, I, I remember talking about it during my high school history classes. But, you know, the problem with a high school history class is they try and cram too much into a, a short lesson. And we talked about the scramble for Africa when we were talking about colonialism in general. So it just kind of got lumped in with everything else. You know, there was the Spanish and the Portuguese in the New World. There were the English and the Dutch. There, were, there was, the, you know, the colonies in Malaysia and the Philippines and the French in Indochina and the, the Opium Wars, and there was a scramble for Africa. Uh, and it, it just makes you think that it's just part of this much longer story of colonialism, which, which it is, but it's also unique. And what's, what's unique about the scramble for Africa, and what, what I never really appreciated before reading this book, is that it took place just over a very short period of 30 years and it got a very late start. I, I mean, you know, you, you think about the age of exploration and the age of colonialism, right? Columbus and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the New World. And that was all happening in the 1500s, 1600s. Uh, you know, the, the British in China and the French in Indochina uh, it got their start kind of in the mid-19th century. And during all that time, nobody was really paying much attention to Africa. And the thing was, they knew about it. I mean, Africa wasn't like some undiscovered continent somewhere. Uh, they'd always known about Africa. I mean, you know, the Romans knew about Africa. I mean, you know, as far back as you want to go, the Europeans had known about Africa. But nobody wanted it. 
I mean, they, they wanted the resources from it. Uh, and of course, you know, they wanted the, the human trafficking, the slave trade and stuff like that. So they had trading outposts there, but nobody thought it would be worthwhile to establish colonies. Uh, the British were perfectly happy to just have trading outposts in Africa. They didn't want to establish a colony and rule it, um, which is strange, right? Because, you know, they wanted everything else. They, they wanted the New World, uh, the Americas. Uh, why didn't they want Africa? Uh, no, no, there's there's three exceptions to this. The Portuguese had set up two colonies way back in the day, uh, Mozambique and Angola, uh, and then South Africa. The the British the British and the Dutch had been fighting over South Africa because it was right on the the tip, so that was kind of a valuable trading route. Um, but aside from that, no, n n nobody else wanted to establish any colonies there until. 1876, suddenly Europe started deciding to grab up colonies, and then once it started, then they couldn't gobble up Africa fast enough. Then all of a sudden, all these European kings and parliamentarians and prime ministers were suddenly panicked that the other European countries were going to get to Africa before they did. And so then they were really scrambling for it, as you read in this book. And during this very short period of time, you know, 30 years, which, you know, given the whole scope of colonial history is a short period of time, they gobbled up pretty much all of Africa. I think Ethiopia was, it was the only place that got left untouched. Or sorry, it didn't get left untouched. The, the Italians tried, um, but re remained independent by the end of it. Um, which begs the question, what is going on? Uh, like, why, why did they leave it alone for so long and then all of a sudden couldn't gobble it up quick enough? That question actually is never directly answered in this book because it's a, it's a narrative history. So it's interested more about telling the stories. Uh, a more analytic history would more examine the causes, what were the economic reasons and stuff like that. I, I mean, I, I believe Lenin has some theories. I'm not terribly familiar with Lenin's writing, but some, something about how this was late stage capitalism and they needed to uh, establish imperialism in order to survive. Although, although even that, and again, granted, I'm not terribly familiar with Lenin's writings, so I shouldn't probably be talking about this. Th that being said though, if, if if that's the theory, even that doesn't really explain it because the, they had been perfectly happy to extort, extort the resources by just having trading posts and kind of informal exploitation of the resources without establishing direct rule, which during the scramble for Africa, they were trying to establish proper colonies. Um, the, the way this book is told is it's kind of a cause and effect. So this event caused this, this event caused this, this event caused this. Uh, and by the time you're all done with it, the, you've, you've got the scramble for Africa. So it's not, it's not really the... And I, I think intelligent readers can, while reading this book, draw some macro causes of what's going on. But the experience of reading it chapter by chapter is just one thing caused another and another thing caused another, you know, like nobody planned out the scramble for Africa. I, I'm, I'm going to leave that there though, talking about why this happened and more just kind of focus on the story that's told within this book because the, the story is really the main selling point. Now, you wouldn't think that the scramble for Africa would make a great narrative history because it's just too vast a subject. I, it covers 35 years, thousands of characters, two continents. You know, you've got all the, the, the European countries which are doing the scrambling. You've got Africa which is being colonized. Um, but the way Thomas Pakenham does this, which is brilliant, is he breaks each incident down into a separate story. So you've got 37 chapters. Each chapter is roughly about 20 pages. And each chapter is one story in the scramble, and, and it's told like a story. And then the end of one chapter will usually end by setting up the conflict that's gonna dominate the next chapter. So that there's some forward momentum as you're reading it, uh, a narrative flow.
Now, occasionally, given everything that's happening, given all these countries that are involved in all the action that happened simultaneously, occasionally he does need to jump slightly backwards in time when he's switching topics. But on the whole, there's a strong narrative momentum that propels you from one event into the next. And although each chapter is its own separate story, there are story threads that are woven throughout the entire book. Uh, for example, the growing British quagmire in Egypt is something that develops over several chapters. Or uh, King Leopold's plotting in the Congo uh, is, again, something that happens over several chapters. What really makes this book a pleasure to read, though, is just how well it's written. Now, I think the best way to illustrate that, rather than me trying to tell you how well it's written, is just maybe to show you by reading an extended quotation. I'm not sure if this is a good idea or not, actually, because if you've watched my videos in the past, you know that sometimes when reading extended quotations, I tend to stumble a bit over the words. So this could be a bad idea, but I'm, I'm going to give it a go anyways. Hopefully this, this will give you a, a feel for it. This is a passage from the chapter Three Flags Across Africa. It describes the exploration of a certain Henry Stanley. Henry Stanley is one of the principal characters of, the, of this book, and he's a fascinating figure. He's, he's a was originally British, but then moved over to America, where he established uh, established himself as a writer. Uh, and he's most famous for the phrase, Dr. Livingston, I presume, which, which I'm sure you've heard about in popular culture. You know, it's just like a popular, iconic quote that everyone knows. Dr. Livingston, I presume. Um, Henry Stanley is the guy who said that quote. Um, so, uh, this is describing Henry Stanley's explorations in, in Africa, and this is somewhat, I don't know, maybe this isn't the best passage to, to quote, because it's not even a narrative passage, it's giving the background to his character. But I, I think this does a good job of showing the, the very interesting characterizations that Pakenham gives to his historical characters. So, uh... The beginning of this chapter starts out in the middle of the action, describing Stanley's explorations in Africa. Then it jumps back in time for a couple pages to give some background on Stanley's character. Uh, and then after describing Stanley's painful childhood, uh, it continues with this exploration of his character. Quote, The months exploring Lake, Lake Tangayaga with Livingstone overwhelmed Stanley. He wept like a boy of eight, he said, when they parted. He had expected a crusty misanthrope. He found a man whose serenity transcended every frustration, a man so gentle and tender-hearted that he shrank from punishing his African servants when they cheated him. Livingston told, told Stanley that his own mission was not so much to preach the gospel to Africa. What could one or two men do in that respect? The first step was to preach to Europe what they must do about the horrors of slave trade, to stop it once and for all. Later the regular missionaries would come, systematically organized, teaching the gospel, tribe by tribe, district by district. Stanley had pledged himself to Livingston's service. He would be Livingston's disciple and, mouth, and mouthpiece. That was the way he saw himself in his own serialized articles in his book, How I Found Livingstone. His writings touched the hearts of millions on both sides of the Atlantic, who had never read a word of Livingstone's own writings. Stanley had written solemnly in his private diary, May I be selected to succeed him in opening up Africa to the shining light of Christianity. My methods, however, will not be Livingstone's. Each man has his own way. His, I think, had its defects, though the old man personally had been almost Christ-like for goodness, patience, and self-sacrifice. The selfish and wooden-headed world requires mastering, as well as loving charity. The mastering on which Stanley himself relied in Africa came more from the Old Testament than the New 
chastisement of his enemies, he called it, and it soon made Stanley notorious. The trouble was that in 1872, there had been many people who found the idea of Stanley as Livingston's disciple too incongruous to stomach. They had greeted how I found Livingston with derision and disbelief. They did not merely doubt Stanley's motives. It was plain he had never met Livingston. Those letters were forgeries, the trip to Africa a stunt, the whole story a pack of lies. To be called a forgerer and impostor dealt Stanley a wound that never fully healed. As he wrote years later, All the actions of my life, and I may say of my thoughts, have been since 1872 colored by that storm of abuse. He had good reason to be touchy. He, he carried deep scars from his own childhood in the, in the workhouse, the double, double stigma of pauperism and illegitimacy. He had tried to conceal them by assuming the identity of a full-blown American, sometimes bending in trivial respects the facts to fit his own story. For example, he claimed to have served as an officer in the U.S. Navy, whereas he had really been a clerk. His own sensitivity made him acutely insensitive to others. The storms of misrepresentation that burst on his head after discovering, discovering Livingston came from, the th came from the three sources. From rival muckraking newspapers, jealous of the New York Herald's amazing scoop. From eminent men of the Royal Geographical Society, hum humiliated by their own amateurish efforts to resupply Livingston. And from personal friends of Dr. Kirk, later Sir John the British agent at Zanzibar, whom Stanley had denounced for not giving proper aid. Stanley had no talent for disarming this kind of enemy. He beat them to the ground, or, as happened increasingly, he ignored them. He said to himself, So numerous were my enemies that my friends became dumb, and I had to resort to silence as a protection against outrage. Silence can be golden. They can sometimes be reckless, too. It made him seem less vulnerable by concealing his acute sensitivity. It hardly served to defend his reputation the next time abuse came down on his head. And soon, like tropical rain, the abuse came down once more. In April 1875, on his return from Atessa's court, sailing in the Lady Alice, Lady Alice is the name of his boat, down the western shore of Lake Victoria, Stanley had fallen foul of some tribesmen at a small island called Bumbira Island. They had refused him food, threatened him with their spears and arrows, pulled his hair as though it had been a wig, dragged the Lady Alice forcibly up the shore, and stolen her oars. Stanley extricated himself with difficulty from this encounter, killing 14 of the enemy but suffering no casualties himself, not even a man wounded. In fact, he lost nothing but his dignity and his oars. The oars were soon recovered, and four months later, Stanley captured and chained up, chained up the petty chief of the island and offered him to his overlord in exchange for a suitable ransom. When the offer was refused, Stanley decided to make an example of the Bumbira. He, his own published account of the incident was vivid, too vivid for his own good. He wanted to punish Bumbira with the power of a father punishing a stubborn yet disobedient son. The method he chose was to return to Bumbira and empty box after box of Snyder bullets into the ranks of the tribesmen while staying just out of range of their spears and arrows. He claimed to have shot down 33 men and wounded a hundred, many fatally. We had great cause to feel gratitude. The victory put everyone in excellent heart. We made a brave show as we proceeded along the coast. The canoes 37 in number containing 50 men, including native allies, paddling to the sounds of sonorous drums and the cheering tones of the bugle, the English, American, and Zanzibar flags flying gaily in union, 
with a most animating scene. A more subtle man than, San than Stanley would have pretended that he, ha that he had hatred for the business. Stanley seemed to have rather enjoyed it and, worse, enjoyed writing about it. If he had been, as he once was, a reporter describing a fight with Red Indians, his tone would have been more acceptable. In Africa, the conventions were different. Protests were made to the Royal Geographical Society and to the Foreign Office. Such incidents disgraced the British flag Stanley boasted of carrying alongside the American one. Stanley's fellow explorers, like Baker, shook their heads. It was quite new for simple explorers to go around plundering villages and shooting natives. Neither Speck nor yourself, Baker wrote to Grant, nor Livingston nor myself ever presumed upon such acts but suffered intrigue and delays with patience. Worst of all, it was Stanley's inability to keep his mouth shut. There is an incurable, sorry, there is an, there is an, amount, of, an amount of bad taste about him that is simply incurable. If Stanley ever returned to England, he would need friends. Why go out of his way to alienate people? But would Stanley return? Stanley was himself far from certain of that in September 1876, despite his voyage in the Lady Alice around Lakes Victoria and Tanganyika, as he set off for Lalaba to try to solve the last great mystery of African geography. End quote. Uh, I took that from pages 26 to 29, and I took out one paragraph uh, elliptic because it was a bit of a digression, but otherwise that's pages 26 to 29. Obviously, that's out of context. Hopefully, it still makes some sort of sense, and hopefully, uh, it gives you a sense of, of the way characters are richly developed in this book. If you, if you found that interesting, I think is a fair representation of how the rest of the book is written. Um, first of all, you'll notice Pakenham's habit of creating suspense in the narrative. As a matter of historical record, of course, he knows full well whether Stanley will return to England or not. But he's not about to tell the reader just yet. He leaves the question hanging and hooks you into reading the next passage. And the whole book is written in this style. You're constantly kept in suspense about how events will resolve. For example, when talking about Gordon and Khatoum, will the reinforcements arrive in time? Uh, when talking about the Imin Pasha lost in the deserts of Africa, sorry, lost in the, in the middle of Africa, is he dead or is he still out there somewhere in Sudan? Who will reach Fashada first, the French or the English? Where the French and the English go to war over Fashada? These, these are all questions that develop over the narrative. Uh, and all of these uh, are keep the reader in suspense. Like a skilled story writer, there is a lot of foreshadowing going on, but no important plot points are given away before their time. Even basic facts, like which countries will get which colonies in Africa, are kept hidden to keep the reader in suspense. Of course, if you get really impatient, there's a map in the back of the book to see how the colonies of Africa ended up, and you could just flip to the back of this, and I did this in paid, I did this occasionally when curiosity got the better of me. Uh, but for the most part, I, I enjoyed this, the suspense in the narrative. Secondly, I, I think that quotation I read out is a good representation of the rich character portraits Pakenham creates. W one of the things I liked about this book is that Pakenham writes about real three-dimensional human beings with complex motivations. He doesn't write about good or bad people, but instead works to see what makes them tick and what makes them do the things that they do. Stanley is one of many fascinating, fascinating characters you met, meet in this book. There's also Braza, the young, idealistic French-Italian explorer, and Stanley's bitter rival, who is convinced that peaceful free trade will help Africa only to become appalled 20 years later at the horrible human rights abuses carried out in the name of free trade in the French Congo colony 
that he himself had founded. And there is Charles Gordon, who is sent by the British government to evacuate the troops out of Khartoum and ends up instead deciding to stay in Khartoum and try and hold out against the enemy, creating a huge political crisis back in London. And there is Cecil Rhodes and his dream of a British empire stretching from Cape Town to Cairo, and who himself later became the founder of Rhodesia. And the Scottish missionary, Alexander Mackay, who tries to evangelize the subjects of the brutal king Mwanga. And Lugard, the British general who is sent to Buganda to protect the missionaries there, and instead, and instead ends up getting into a power struggle with the French Catholic missionaries, which has deadly results. And Emin Pasha, a German convert to Islam who is rumored to be holding out in the mysterious corners of the Sudan with the remnants of, of Gordon's army, while European expeditions try to figure out whether he was alive or dead, and many, many other fascinating figures who populate this book. Peckham also uses his skill at storytelling to describe the political side of the story, what was happening back in Europe. Now, I would never recommend this book to anyone who didn't like history, but if you like history, and if you enjoy some of the political and diplomatic intrigue, you'll find that in this book also. You'll also find plenty of rich characters populating the chambers of European politics, like Gladstone, Prime Minister of England and the Grand Old Man of the English Liberal Party. He is firmly convinced imperialism is evil and has campaigned on this platform for years, but because of political pressures, he gives in to the empire builders at several key points. And Lord Salisbury, whose policy is to use diplomacy rather than war to obtain British colonies in Africa. And Bismarck of Germany, who skillfully uses the scramble in Africa to try and keep all of Germany's enemies off balance. And King Leopold, who through years of secret diplomatic negotiation is able to turn the tiny European power of Belgium into a great colonial power in Africa. And Bulldog Moreau and Roger Tiger Casement, two British humanitarians who worked tirelessly to expose the horrible atrocities going on in the Belgian Congo. And Winston Churchill, young rising star in the British colonial office who struggles to keep the colonial governors under control, and so many other interesting characters. And finally, like all good history books, this is not only entertaining, but you learn a lot from it. In particular, it gives you a very good idea of why the map of Africa is drawn like it is and perhaps as a result, gives a fair way of helping you to understand African politics today. In fact, given how little we Americans know about the continent of Africa, I really wish somebody would have made me read this during my school days. I mean, it's, it's too long to be assigned reading to a student, I guess, but it, it almost should be. If I were teaching a college history class, I would make sure that this book is on the curriculum. Uh, because I, I, th I think it gives you a very good understanding of how Africa ended up the way it did, with, with the lines on the map the way they are now. And in addition to learning about Africa, this book also teaches you about the prominent statesmen in Europe during the period, and it shows how the scramble for Africa helped, helped build into the lead-up for World, World War I. So the period of the scramble for Africa ends in 1914, and of course 1914 is the beginning of World War I. So you can see that uh, the, the tensions in Europe are building, and part of those tensions were over the scramble for Africa. Uh, and by the end of this book, you're beginning to see how England, France, and Russia are already in an, in an alliance against Germany. So it's a, it's a pretty good lead up to World War I. Okay, on to the negatives. I do have some criticisms. Now, all, all of these are quibbles. They're nitpicks. They're minor. Uh, but, but let's get into this. Um, <clears throat> there is an incredible amount of characters to keep track of. Um, because the author gives most of them very memorable descriptions, like, like the description I quoted about Stanley, 
they usually stick in your mind and for the most part you can easily 